gather for these few moments that are left in this hour of power worship service and desire to hear what the Lord would teach and preach and speak into our lives today. I'm going to invite you to hear a reading from the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark in the ninth chapter, there is a portion of Scripture beginning in verse number 14 that I want to read out of the New King James Version this morning. Mark chapter 9, beginning verse 14, if you have a Bible on your smart device or a real Bible in your hand. We invite you, if you're physically able, to stand with us that together we might heed and hear the reading of the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning in verse number 14. And when Jesus came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with him. Immediately when they saw Jesus, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him greeted him. And Jesus asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered the man and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought the boy to Jesus, and when the boy saw Jesus, immediately the spirit convulsed, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And the father answered, From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to the man, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to a deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and he came out of him. And the boy became as one dead, so that many said, the boy is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he came into the house, his disciples asked him privately, saying, Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, This kind can come out by nothing other than prayer and fasting. Uh, you, 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 you may be surprised to know what I feel like preaching about this morning. Today I want to talk about church hurt. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. In this ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, we once again are introduced to a nameless, anonymous person who's about to have a healing, interactive experience with Jesus Christ. Anonymous like the woman with the issue of blood in Mark 5. Anonymous like the man at the pool of Bethesda in John 5. Here in Mark 9, we are once again come face to face with a brother whose name we do not know. Now I suggest to you that one of the reasons God allows some of those we encounter in Scripture to remain anonymous is God's way of using the author to remind us that this person could be anybody. And if you are hard pressed to know his name, fill in the blank with your own. Because if the truth be told, everybody in here is going to have a Mark 9 experience at some moment in your walk with Jesus. Can I take my time to argue my case this morning? Um, notice the similarity between this brother and your world. 
The Bible tells us right off the front that he's a father who's got a problem. Before we even know the diagnosis of the condition, before we deal with what demonic spirit we're wrestling with, before you even know what the issue is, here's what you got to know. He's a brother that's got a problem. And that means he's a lot like you and a lot like me. Because I came by early this Sunday morning to remind you what the grown folk in church already know. And that is that problems are on all of our agendas. Trouble is on your itinerary. You don't get a pass from going through the storms of life. I don't care how big your Bible is. I don't care how many seed offerings you sow. I don't care how many ministries have your name on it. I don't care how many generations sat in the seat you sit in and how many of your grandmama's prayers you heard lifted up. I don't care how many hymns you can sing. The reality is, is that all of us will go through some problems. As a matter of fact, if you're old enough to know that in this life, it ain't one, if it ain't one thing, it's another, you ought to just wink an amen right there. If you know that if when you got one thing solved, another thing just seems to break down. If, if, if it ain't your money, it's your health. If it ain't your health, it's your marriage. If it ain't your marriage, it's your kids. If you got two kids, the minute you get one right, the other starts acting a fool. There's always some problems. Y'all, and the problem, watch this, is not his own, it's his son. Because somebody tell you that if you live long enough, sooner or later, somebody you love is going to have some problems that affect you. Go on, preach, pastor. The grown folk know when you live long enough, there and sooner or later, the problem is going to be in the life of somebody you care about. If you live long enough, somebody you love is going to get a bad diagnosis. If you live long enough, that child that you used to feed is going to be the problem. If you live long enough, mama going to get old. If you live long enough, somebody you love is going to die. He's got a problem that affects someone he loves. And here's the worst thing. It's a chronic problem. Jesus asked the father, how long has your son been like this? The man's response is, he's been like this since the day he was born. Beloved, because there's some problems you don't ask for. There's some problems you don't acquire. There's some problems you didn't even bring on yourself. There's some problems you inherited. There's some problems they were genetically made in you. There's some problems you've been dealing with for a long time, and somebody in the sanctuary today knows what it's like to have an issue that haunts you from the day you were born. You didn't ask for it, you didn't desire it, but you've been wrestling with it for a long time. Some problems don't go away overnight. Some problems, one prayer doesn't bring an end to it. Some problems, week in, week out, day in, day out, month in, month out, year in, year out. This is something you've got to learn to live with because no matter how much you pray, no matter how many Sundays you come to church, this is something you've got to deal with. And like all of us who've got problems that are chronic, that affect loved ones, this man comes to the conclusion that what he needs is Jesus. I, I could stop right there if this was a Baptist church. Uh, that, that he comes to the mindset that with all that's going on in my life, what I need is to get in the presence of the Lord. That if I can just get in a place where the Lord is being worshipped and the Lord's presence is, that somehow, some way, being in the presence of the Lord makes a difference. As a matter of fact, that's what got you up at 6 o'clock to get dressed, to leave the house at 6.30, to get to church by 7.15, because somebody came today saying, I need to be in the presence of the Lord. If you know that's you, nudge your neighbor, tell them, don't mess with me today. Don't play with me right here. I didn't come to play with the Lord. I came because I need the Lord to touch my life. I, 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 
I came to get in his presence. And notice what he says when he gets in the Lord's presence. I feel like preaching. He says, Lord, if you can do anything. Do you hear the doubt there? If you can do anything. Brother, this is Jesus. Hey, ain't no if. His prayer ought to be, Lord, since you can do everything. But he says, if you can do anything, Jesus must sense that something is faulty with the man's faith. Because notice how Jesus responds. He said, look, brother, the, the issue ain't whether I can do it. The issue is, do you believe? Jesus, look, 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 if you got faith, we work this thing out. If you know that I'm able, you can walk away with what you need. If you can trust in me, I can turn this thing around. If you'll hold on to me, I'll make certain that we get through this thing. I need to know, do you believe? The son's healing is directly connected to the father's faith. All he's got to do is say, I believe. But listen at the transparency of his life when he says to the Lord, I believe, but I need you to help my unbelief. Beloved, this is where this brother is more like you and me than we ever want to confess. Because he's got to learn to navigate between belief and unbelief. Listen, listen, I'm not talking about you. I'm just talking about the person sitting in your seat this morning. If all of us, including your pastor, have moments when we can say definitively, I believe. But quiet is kept. There's some unbelief. There's some areas where I trust God instinctively. There's some moments when I wonder what in the world God is doing. There's some times my faith is rooted strong in the Lord. Yeah. And there's some moments I've got some doubts and uncertainties. I don't bring them to the pulpit. I don't share them openly with some saints because that's not expedient for them. But if you follow me at home at night, you'll find that sometimes my prayer goes like this, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Yeah. Listen, there are areas where it is easy to believe God. And then there are areas where it's difficult. It's hard to trust and believe in God when you've got an issue that's just been recurring and keeps coming up. Listen, listen, it's easy to trust God until you got to trust God too long. I, I mean, it's easy to pray until you didn't pray over the same thing a hundred times. It's easy to hold on to God until you got to hold on too long. My dad used to put it like this when he was talking to church folk. He said, listen, ain't nothing wrong with getting sick. Just don't be sick too long. Because after a while, folks stop praying for you. Folks stop calling. Folks stop visiting that when you've been sick too long, eventually your name been on that prayer list too long. And doubt creeps in when you have to wait. Doubt creeps in when you're expecting God to do what you've never seen God do for anyone else. It's easy to believe God for what you saw God do with your neighbor. But it's hard to believe God for something you need God to do that you've never witnessed in your own life. So this man decides, I, I, I've got to do something, and, and he comes to where he thinks Jesus is. Now, I need to teach Bible for a moment. You need to know that when the brother shows up with his sick son, Jesus is not where the man comes. According to the beginning of Mark chapter 9, Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration. That is Mount 
Hermon. That is where Jesus' glory is revealed. He's got Peter, James, and John on the mountain. He reveals his glory, and Moses and Elijah show up. They are having worship on top of the mountain, and the disciples are at the base of the mountain. And Jesus, while he's up top, the disciples are down low, and the man brings his son not to Jesus who's up high, but he brings him to the disciples who are down low. And when he recognizes that Jesus is not there, he still makes the request for the disciples to heal his son because in his mind is the expectation that if I can't get to Jesus, if I can get to his disciples, his disciples ought be able to do what Jesus can do. The expectation is that the folk who follow Jesus ought to be able to act like Jesus. Uh, uh, the ones that been walking with him ought to be able to perform some of his works that while he's up on high, the disciples who are left down low ought to be able to do the same thing that Jesus has done. His mindset is that if I can get around the disciples of Jesus, my son ought to be healed. My situation ought to be turned around. My stuff ought to be made better because the disciples ought to do what Jesus does. He gets to the disciples. He asks them to cast the demon out. And this is what the Bible says. They could not. Uh, Earl, the disciples have failed to do what Jesus can do. He's now got to deal with the fact that disciples don't always do what they should do. That this gathering of folk who say they follow Jesus have let me down. I walked in your gathering believing that things would change when I got around y'all and I'm as broken in your midst as I was outside your doors. These disciples have failed him. And I would argue with you that some of the doubt he brings to Jesus it's because he's had to deal with some disciples who have failed to mimic the ministry of Jesus. Oh, I feel like preaching right there. Y'all, the world is filled with men and women who have struggled with God because they've had to deal with some failed disciples. Uh, the expectation that the world has is that when I get in the gathering of disciples, and when I'm with the saints on Sunday, when I step in the doors of your church, if there's a cross on your steeple, and some hymnals on your pew, and some Bibles in your hand, and there's some shouting going on, that in that midst, my life ought to be made better. In that presence, things ought to change, that I ought to be stronger and better. Uh, th there's the expectation that when I get around saints, I'll get some smiles. That in the presence of saints, ought to be some hugs. That when I get around saints, I must find some folk that don't mind if I'm not dressed like they're dressed. That when I get around saints, I'm gonna get to the sanctuary and and the sister ain't gonna mind putting her purse on the floor and scooting over so I can sit on the pew and worship God together. That the usher's gonna smile at me. That my neighbor won't get mad if I stand up and shout and say, God's been good to me. That somehow there's the expectation that in the presence of the disciples, healing will happen. But more often than not, people get in the presence of disciples and are wounded. Hurt by harsh words, 
rejected by judgmentalism in the church, offended by hypocrisy and immature leadership and double standards and nasty folk. Listen, don't, don't look at nobody. Look, look, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. But I want you to know in case you ain't experienced it yet, and you may, ain't nothing like church hurt. Have, have you ever been hurt in church? Have you ever had stuff go down with disciples that made you realize they ain't following Jesus? Have you ever had experiences where folks said something to you out the side of their neck and then turned around and had the nerve to sing Amazing Grace? Yeah. Ain't no hurt like church hurt. Ain't no ugly like church ugly. And some of the meanest, yeah. don't tell nobody this outside the church, but some of the meanest, the nastiest, the ugliest, the cutting upest, the cussingest folk you didn't ever want to meet are folk that gather in church on Sunday. Somebody whisper, I know that's right. And this brother has to come to grips with something all of us will deal with. And that's that every now and then, church may hurt. What's a word of encouragement to those who deal with church hurt? To those who've been wounded on holy ground? To those who've been injured by words from folk with Bibles in their hands? Well, if I were there with the brother one of the first things I would have told him that I'm going to pass on to you is that I wanted him to understand that those disciples he was dealing with at the base of the mountain, they fail all the time. Don't have an unrealistic expectation of those disciples. Yes, they follow Jesus. Yes, they gave up a whole lot. Yes, they wear clothes that look like they ought to be disciples. But I come by to tell you, that group failed all the time. You remember that group? That, that was the group when Jesus was on his way to Calvary and he's beginning to preach about the kingdom of God, trying to get them to understand his death. He turned around to find out them jokers were arguing about who's going to be president and vice president of the ministry after he was gone. That group elected Peter to be their leader. You remember Peter, don't you? The one that cut a guard, the one that cussed out a girl, the one that denied he knew Jesus. That group failed all the time. When Jesus was dying on the cross, wasn't but one of them there. All the rest of them were off hiding because that group failed all the time. That group was sailing in a boat with Jesus in the back. A storm came and they got scared even though Jesus was still with them. That group failed all the time. And one thing you ought to remind yourself anytime you come through the doors of the church is that disciples can fail all the time. Listen, I don't, I don't want to discourage you about coming to church. I just want you to have some realistic understanding that folk can be saved and not be changed. Oh, uh, uh, uh. Everyone who walks with Jesus don't always act like Jesus. And every now and then you got to learn how to call out folk who claim to be what they ain't. You, you got to know how to handle folk uh, that, that pretend to be from where they are not. Okay, I'm, I'm going to help you because you ain't caught me yet. I'm going to help you. Um, I need to see the hands of everyone in the sanctuary that was raised in a major urban environment. If you, if you was raised in the city, I'm talking about skyscrapers, uh, highways, byways, 
Uh, you were raised in a city that had different sides of town. You, not, not just one main street, you, you, you had different sides of town. If you was raised in a major city, wave your hand, wave your hand, okay, okay. Now, now, um, um, some of y'all are lying. <laughs> and, and folk who are from real major cities have issue with folk that lie. Watch this. Uh, I, my, see, I'm from Chicago, right? I, I, no, I'm, no, I'm in Chicago. I, I'm from the south side of Chicago. I, I, you, you know you're from the city when you talk about where you were. I was raised off of, off, I was raised off of uh, 79th and Stoney. I, I'm, I'm from Chicago, right, right? And, 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 and T, every now and then when I'm on the road and people here are from Chicago, they come up to me and they shake my hand and say, oh, I'm from Chicago. And I ask them, what part of town? And some folk have the audacity to name a suburb. Uh, I'm from Chicago. And they talking about, uh, I'm, I'm from Maywood. Uh, I'm, I'm from Calumet City. I'm, I'm from Kanky. You ain't from Chicago. And folk that are raised in major urban cities have issue with folk that perpetrate to be from where you are not. Now, you may not be from, you may be near it, but you ain't from it. Uh, you may be in the outskirts, but you ain't from it. You, you may be in the suburbs, but you ain't from it. And every now and then, when you run upon some mean and ugly and gossiping and nasty Christians, you need to call them out and let them know, now you ain't from Christ. You may be around, you, you may be from a suburb, and you may be from the outskirts, but you ain't from Jesus. <laughs> Do me a favor, uh, uh, nudge somebody and ask them where you from, where you from, where you from. Where you from? Where you from? Because if you don't know how to love, you ain't from Christ. If you judge, you ain't from Christ. If you got a bad attitude every week, you ain't from Christ. If you say an ugly stuff out of your mouth and you don't know how to bite your tongue, you ain't from Christ. Because if you were from Christ, you would act differently, you would walk differently, you would receive differently. There's some folk that are claiming to be something they ain't. Where you from? Can I teach this text? I feel like preaching. Well, I gotta get out to Six Flags. Y'all pray for me. They, they gonna make me get on one of them rides and me and, We're gonna have altar call before church is over, amen? Uh, um, the man comes to the disciples. The disciples fail. Watch this, now I wanna make sure you catch this, Jesus is not down there, Jesus is up there. And he's up there with Peter, James, and John. Moses and Elijah show up for a cameo, and when they're gone, Jesus comes back down with Peter, James, and John. And there's an argument going on between the scribes and the disciples. Stay with me, I know where I'm going. The scribes and the disciples are arguing. Jesus stops the argument and says, what y'all fussing about? The dad steps up and says, I brought my son to your disciples, and your disciples wasn't worth nothing. <laughs> your followers couldn't do a thing. Now, here's the amazing thing, y'all. He's already experienced the failure of the disciples, but he's still there when Jesus comes back. Come he hadn't left. He didn't quit. He didn't pack up and go to another church. The disciples have already failed, and he's still standing around. Y'all, let me tell you why it's so important, because in the world we live in, the generation we walk and minister in, Christianity is filled with folk that the minute they experience the failure of disciples, they quit. You go looking for another church, where you gonna find some more failed disciples. You don't like Alpha Street, you're going down to Greater Alpha Street. 
If that don't work, you go to Second Alpha Street. <laughs> you do know if you're ever in a city and there's a church and another church named Greater That Church, that was a group that dealt with some failed disciples and went and started their own thing. People leave. Why is this brother still there? Well, to understand why I believe he hasn't left, you've got to know what's happening. He stays because after the disciples have failed, the scribes and the disciples start arguing. Come here, come here. You've got to know what a scribe is. A scribe was a subsect, S-E-C-T, of the Pharisees. And the scribes had one job. The scribes read the law. They transcribed the law. They passed the law on, and they taught the law. These are the folk that would open up the scrolls of Isaiah. They would make copies of the scrolls of Isaiah. They would pass the scrolls off to the synagogue, and then they would teach the scroll to those in the synagogue. The scribes were those who dealt with the word. They read the word. They transcribed the word. They passed the word along, and they taught the word. The scribes only dealt with the word of God, which means you can infer that the debate the disciples are having with the scribes is about the word. And could it be that this man who's experienced the failure of the disciples has not left because even though the disciples have failed, somehow, some way, they're now talking about the Word of God. They are debating the Word of God. They are teaching the Word of God. They are digging into the Word of God. And he decides that even if the disciples have failed me, since the Word is being taught and the Word is being proclaimed and the Word is being lifted up, I'm not going nowhere because I didn't come to see the disciples. I came to get a word from the Lord. Can I preach right here? As long as the word is being proclaimed and you are receiving the word of God, you ought to be able to deal with some disciples. So the real question is, what did you come for? Uh, if you came to see disciples, you're going to quit. If you came to get a title, you're going to quit. If you came because you want to sing the solo and show them your gift, you're going to quit. If you came to find your next boo. Uh, you're going to quit. But if you got up on Sunday morning and went through all you went through, to get to the house of the Lord for one reason, because I need a word from the Lord. Is there anybody here that says I came to get a word? And as long as the word is going out, I can deal with some disciples. He stays because the word is there. Yeah. I want him to know that disciples feel all the time don't have unrealistic expectations. Watch this third thing. I'm done now. We got to go. He stays around even though disciples have failed. And here's the miracle. And Jesus showed up. Yeah. Uh, if he had left, he would not have seen that Christ shows up in the midst of failed disciples. Um, Dean Curtis, here's the amazing thing. When Jesus comes, he comes back with some folk, because remember, he was not on the mountain by himself. Let me see if he's paying attention, pop quiz. Who was on the mountain with Jesus? Peter, James, and John. Now, you Bible readers know Peter, James, and John, that's Jesus' inner circle. Them the disciples that got it right. Them the ones he loved. Them the ones that stayed close. Peter, James, and John were on the mountain with Jesus, which meant that the other nine at the bottom were the ones that didn't qualify to go. 
That, that, that was Thomas and, and Thaddeus and, and Judas and Bartholomew and, and Matthew. That, that, them, them was the ones that was left down there. And when Jesus comes back, he comes back with three others. And so now the man has to come to this realization that all the disciples didn't fail, only some of them. But that the Lord has some Peters and some James and some Johns who don't act like Thaddeus and Thomas and Bartholomew, but there are some good saints who love the Lord and been walking with the Lord and been talking with the Lord. And watch this. If you're tired of Matthew, go find a Peter. If you get sick of Thomas, there's a John somewhere that all the disciples ain't bad. Yes, there are some failed disciples on every pew, but I've been in church long enough now to tell you that there are some good sisters and some good brothers and some praying saints and some worshiping saints who gather in this place. The worst thing you can do is lump all the disciples into one category. Yeah, there's some folk that fail. But in every church, there's some folk that walk with Jesus. There's some folk that love the Lord with all their heart. There's some folk that join because they just want to serve, just want to be used by God. And don't ever let a few run you out when God's got some good ones around. This is a mighty good place to extend an invitation. But before I do so, because I know Alfred Street, I need to let you know nothing is going on in church. <laughs> Tasha, some, someone's going to hear this sermon and I wonder what happened. <laughs> this week, with all the stuff that those who know that happened with Leandria Johnson, and the discussions online is made aware of how many people deal with church hurt. How many people have been wounded by failed disciples. And I just want you to know what I wish the world will, and that is that church is never proclaimed to be a place of perfect people. It's not a museum, it's a hospital. And that you ought to come not for the disciples, but to get the word. And that even when you deal with some failed disciples, that's not everybody. Yeah. And there are some good people in the house of the Lord. And I just want you to be one of them. Amen. So maybe today, if you're here, as our deacons come, if you have experienced church hurt, now's a good time to experience something better. This is what we say at Alfred Street. If you go to a restaurant and you're not treated right, you don't stop eating. You just find another restaurant to go to. If your beautician messes up your hair, you don't start doing it yourself. You find another beautician to go to. Alpha Street is not a perfect place, but I want you to know that what you've heard is just about true. We're a place that believes we ought to love one another and that we ought to live out our love in the world and change the world with the love of Jesus Christ.